That's what the story is about, who it is that I help, not who am I and why am I so great. Business of Architecture, episode 285. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and I am your host on this show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's guest is Dean Lincoln Hires. He's one of the co-founders of Sage Presence, and Dean helps architecture firms win commissions through interview and presentation coaching to help them communicate their value and win the deal. He and his partner are the authors of the book, Winning AEC Interviews. You'll hear how you can get a free copy of that book on today's show. In addition, the deals they've been involved in have resulted in over $4.5 billion in one projects, including the U.S. Bank Stadium, where the 2018 Super Bowl was held. So Dean is not a new kid on the block when it comes to uh, coaching people how to better present and better communicate their message to win the deal. On today's episode, you'll discover Dean's top three tips for winning your next project presentation. Now, if you haven't already, I have a special video that I've prepared specifically for podcast listeners like yourself that shows how you can double your architecture firm income in the next 12 months. It's called the Architecture Firm Profit Map Video, and you can get access to this video free access by going to freearchitectgift.com. So head on over there, put in your best email address, and get access to that video. Now, on with today's show. Hello, Dean. Welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Enoch, it's great to be here with you. It is great to have you on here. And as I mentioned in the introduction, you have a wonderful book that I had the opportunity to go through, Winning AEC Interviews. So give us a summary of the high points of what our listeners can discover when they read that book. Why should they go get it? Well, one of the things that all professional service firms share is you can't really sell your service without selling yourselves, the people, the teams that have to win over the project. If you think of like a lawyer, nobody hires, nobody wants law services, they hire a lawyer. And so a lot of interviews are won by your offering, but a lot of interviews are also won by your ability to be an authentic person, to make a connection with the selection committee, and have a strategy about how to win them over and help them with this tough decision that they're facing. So this book takes you through the strategy, it takes you through message design, and it takes you through the art of delivery so that you can win over as people and have the stage presence that it takes to win an interview. Let's talk about your route to getting to this point, to being the master of presentation and interviews. Dean, where did you begin your journey that led you to where you are today? Well, I was a filmmaker most of my life. I started making films when I was a teenager. And I think that there was a surprising turn. I ran a media company. I made an independent feature and sold it to Warner Brothers. And I was going down this path of film and all of a sudden a really strange twist happened. I got hired by the Department of the Interior to teach acting to covert agents. Uh, suddenly I'm a spy trainer. It, it was more of a, a series of gigs. It wasn't like a position, but I'm working out at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Georgia and I'm working at Fort Ripley and teaching acting to spies. And it opened my eyes up to the fact that this stuff that I thought of as fiction actually applies to reality. So to motor quickly forward, the next thing I know, I'm coaching murder trials for Hennepin County of Minneapolis because these attorneys have to have the stage presence to win over a jury. And three wins, which basically means putting somebody behind bars for life, it didn't feel quite right. And so I discovered architects, an acting workshop I had filled up with architects, and they were facing interviews. And that's when Sage Presence was formed to help people win interviews. So that was kind of the course. Suddenly I'm coaching the US Bank Stadium where the Super Bowl was for construction. And uh, next thing I know, 18 years goes by, and uh, my team and I have coached about four and a half billion dollars worth of total project wins. It's a surprise to me. The world of film became the world of reality, no longer fiction. Great. So do you mind if we dissect that a bit? Yeah. There's a lot to unpack there, so proceed with caution. <laughs> Let's do it. So looking back, when you were in the in the filmmaking space. Now, filmmaking is different than acting, is that right? 
Uh, well, I was a director and actors would, would work for me and writers would work for me. I discovered, I learned from writers. Uh, the, the whole message design thing wasn't my internal forte. I was more a concept guy, but I really clicked with delivery. I was able to help actors find their presence, get over their stage fright, get over their fear of the camera. Or if you had say a Hollywood actor and then you had some smaller local actor who was terrified, I could kind of make a, a playground where everyone could be free. And so I worked best with actors on performance and really freeing their, their inner child to come out and play and feel happy and do what they needed to do. How did you do that, Dean? Well, some of it was an, an, uh, a leaning towards emotional intelligence. A lot of the, the job is to deal with the, with the feelings and to help people learn the art of appreciation. Now, uh, my father was a world religions professor, and he often talked about how the state of gratitude kind of came with all prophets, it came with all religious and spiritual people, the state of gratitude that gave them comfort and confidence. And so that translates to an emotion called appreciation. And we used appreciation as one of the key ingredients of, of finding your inner peace when you're under pressure. So we worked a lot with appreciating cameras and other people and the pressure and appreciation opened people up and got their focus off their fears. Well, that's a very, very interesting conversation. Recently with a number of architects who in some of the programs that I run, we've been going through this exercise of doing daily videos or just doing videos, right? Speaking to a camera. And as I'm sure you know, from long experience, it's very easy to get tongue tied. When someone's yeah. looking at the camera, looking at the scary device that just has this glass eye staring, staring back at you, you know, and so I'm intrigued by this idea of freeing the inner child. What if you were to walk someone through this idea of appreciation and gratitude, how can, what are some exercises we could do to get comfortable? Let's just start with the camera and then we can roll that into some other conversations. Sure. Well, the good news is there really is one activity that has been universal and, and pivotal for us. You ask yourself, what do I appreciate? What can I appreciate here? So right now, I actually don't see you, Enoch. I see a camera lens, and I'm, I'm appreciating that. You see my, my vibe gets positive. This is my window to all the people who are gonna some, going to be watching this podcast. So that's what I appreciate. So what we've done with people is we start sending them into different areas and asking them to practice, asking themselves that question. What can I appreciate here? And try to feel the, the feedback of appreciating as you get that warm feeling when it's working. And the best part of it is it moves your focus off of you and onto who you're trying to appreciate. So you can be driving in the car and see, you know, someone pulls out in front of you and suddenly ask yourself, what can I appreciate? about this and maybe you appreciate your brake test wow i've got great brakes in this audi or whatever you're driving and and you can always flip the emotion into that calmer positive warmer place by doing that activity so the more you practice the more it's a switch that you can flip and find your warmth and how does that relate to the things that you would teach these covert agents going back in history here <laughs> that was a really really crazy experience the, the specific request is, I need you to teach my people what to do when somebody puts a gun at their head and tells them that they think they're a cop or something like that. It really was the gun to my head question. And what was the big surprise? I, I had to ask these groups, you know, so how, how many of you have had that happen? And every hand goes up. So being interrogated is a very common thing when you're a covert agent. And we taught them to use appreciation to calm themselves down. So the, the brain gets a tunnel vision. When stress comes in, suddenly you can't, you can't access your broader self. You go into your lizard brain. And appreciation, uh, it, it changes your mindset back to, you get your peripheral vision back and, and you get to a more peaceful place. So we found that very, very pivotal in helping covert agents uh, deal with the, with the pressure of fearing that they're going to give themselves away, which, you know, if you're an actor and you do a bad performance, you're going to show up in the variety section. These people do a bad performance and they show up in the obituary. So they have fear. But anyway, it, it changes the game on fear. It turns it into something that's a little bit more positive and exciting. 
Sure. So, it, you know, it's one level for me to look at my camera and to appreciate maybe who this is touching, who it's going out to, or some other thing about my life. But I got to admit, it's, it's a whole nother thing to have someone literally have a gun to your head. And, you know, if you don't make the, if you say the wrong thing, you show the slightest nervousness or you twitch or you sweat that, like you said, you'll end up in the morgue. So, yeah, well, think about, think about this. Appreciate that you're sweating. Appreciate that it makes sense to, to have pressure. You know, appreciate the logic of it all. I've never had a gun to my head, but I did get mugged or uh, someone was going to mug me. And instantly I click, and by the way, this isn't self-defense class. I can't promise this outcome, but I started appreciating. I liked this guy. Instantly I went to this place and we started talking. And pretty soon we're, we're kind of side to side talking about life. And I turned the game and I didn't get mugged and I walked away with all my money. We actually shook hands. So that's the closest experience I have with something like that. But, but let's make sure we connect it to your audience. You get that same fight or flight pressure when you get, just get up in front of a group. You're in your own team and you stand up and try to pitch an idea. You'll get some of it. Selection committee, you're facing Stonehenge. You know, it's all these people that are giving you no feedback. That pressure comes in and it creates all the wrong body language. And more than half of a presentation uh, or a Q&A session is the body language. What's your body saying? Because it has messages. So that's the best way to control them. Great. So what I'm hearing from you, Dean, is that if we control our focus, what we're focusing on mentally, that then affects our emotions, the emotions that we're feeling, which then manifests our body language, which then allows us to communicate a certain message. Correct. The chain is thoughts trigger feelings. They show and radiate through body language. So the thought of what do I appreciate here? What can I appreciate here changes the heart set and then body language follows. So you don't have to worry about your posture. You don't have to worry about stand a certain way. Oh, and people say smile. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. Worry about appreciating and feeling the feeling and then let it go. That's the advice to give your kids too on their portraits. They take their, you know, smiling is raising up your cheeks and, and on its own, it's a terrible, the attempt to smile doesn't work. You have to feel it. So focus on the feeling of appreciation. Awesome. And so this is useful. And so we're kind of talking about this idea that can be applied to a one-on-one -on -one conversation, to a stage presence. Now, when we think about this idea of, of coaching these lawyers that you said you did for these murder trials, right? This starts to draw a parallel between what someone might do in an AEC interview, right? Where you're Remain presenting somewhere. to a group. Yes. So how does this idea then translate into the actual presence of someone when they're standing in front of a group of people and not in a one-on-one -on -one conversation? It's a, it's a great question that you asked. It's very insightful because all of a sudden it's a group. And part of that pressure effect is the multiple eyeballs. No matter where I look, somebody's looking at me. It feels like there's no escape. And then you, you have this idea that I need to talk to everyone. So we've got people who they, they dart around and they try to talk to the whole group. The, t the ticket is to actually address one person at a time and really spend that time appreciating just one person. So if I could, let's pretend there's someone over there and there's someone over there and there's you and maybe there's someone over there. What I want to do, what, what my natural instinct is under the pressure is I will start bouncing around to everyone and then occasionally maybe look away and collect my thought. And what I'd like to suggest we do is we just stay with one person and give them a whole thought. And then as we work the room, we're making a, a personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection. And can't you feel this when I suddenly come back to you and there you are and I'm appreciating you. And that energy allows you to address a group one person at a time instead of trying to, to spray your attention on everyone. And, and you can feel now, even though this is an imaginary person, the connection of the audience is all together as one. So you can move and shift with slower, uh, a slower pattern. And then you can build a relationship with each person in the moment. So react to that. Could you see it? Could you feel it? Absolutely, I could. And for our podcast listeners who may be listening and not watching, you know, Dean, basically, he was looking to my left speaking, complete sentence, at least one complete sentence delivered. Then he spoke to the right, again, complete sentence or phrase delivered, and then back to me, 
complete communication. So absolutely, Dean, I did feel the difference. You know, obviously when you're looking in a different direction, I don't feel like I'm included, but then when you're looking at me directly, I feel that connection. In an audience, strangely, most people do still feel connected because they can feel themselves. A selection committee is part of a group. So when you're attending to someone, it does feel like the audience. And um, one of the ways I learned this is back in college, I had a professor. I didn't understand this until years later, but I thought he cared about me more than anyone else in the class. And he was doing a, a, an approach. He would talk to one person for a thought, basically. And then I would sort of assume that he had to talk to the other 90 students in the class. So that's why he would look away. And for whatever reason, I thought I was the most important person in his room. And I recognized that he was addressing the class, which I was a subset of. Later, I realized he was doing that. That's, it's not where I, I came up with the technique. It's what confirmed the technique. And well, that and 18 years of putting it in, in a courtroom and in interviews, it works. That definitely, I mean, that feels good, right? To be on the receiving end of that. And there is a difference between someone who's darting around and displaying these signs of nervousness. Absolutely. And actually, let me talk about, if, if I may, there's, we have a lot of principles in firms that ask, I, I need my people to be bolder. Have you, have you ever run across that? Because it takes a certain amount of boldness. I've started speaking. Most of my keynotes now are, I call it the new bold. It, a lot of people don't think they can be bold. A lot of the people uh, in architecture are introverts. They're analyticals. They're most comfortable when they're processing information ahead of time. They like their own space. And you're asking them to step out of their comfort zone. They think boldness is what someone else has. And the old bold might have been that way. I, I talk about it. The old bold was command and conquer. It was all um, stern and strong energy. I think the new bold is command and nurture. And I've been promoting this sort of dualist, uh, dualistic vibe where you have strength. So direct eye contact for those who can see, this is confidence me really locking on and staying with you. The nurture comes through appreciation where I have the, the confidence, but it's much more approachable. And you need the approachability to be likable. You need the sternness to show um, your, your strength. And so eye contact very direct with appreciation creates a new version of bold. And analyticals and uh, shy people and uh, introverts they can find themselves in that version of bold and it's easier to step up. Does that make sense? It's kind of an advanced concept on just the appreciation, but the, you, you want both of those things. Absolutely. Dean, when we look at architecture firms around the world and what they're struggling with a lot in these high pressure situations, whether they're presenting live, whether they've been shortlisted, they're going against a bunch of other firms, really from the client's perspective, the client's trying to figure out, okay, what makes this firm different than all the other firms that are competing for this particular project? What suggestions do you have for how firms can differentiate themselves from their competitors? Well, we're already thinking through the standard differentiators. We're thinking through what about our firm and what about our service offering is different and what resources do we bring? A, a great place to start is how you orient your information. So it, imagine this, stories have main characters in them and stories have heroes in them and stories have, a lot of, uh, have, have movement from a not so good place to a better place. You want to be the hero of the story. You don't want to be the main character. So what, what the selection committee sets up for you that's a bit of a, um, an unplanned trick is they say, come tell me about you, which makes you think you're the main character. Impress us. Tell us why you, why should you get this job? And it puts the whole thought process on, you know, defend your life and, and, and you think you're the main character. I never want to be the main character. I want to be the hero and I want you to be the main character. So, so let me just show the flipping the script here. Someone says to me, Dean, what do you do? My instinct is to talk about me, but go ahead, ask me, Dean, what do you do? And, and listen, listen for how I flip the main character. Hey Dean, good to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Can you tell me what is it that you do? Well, thank you Enoch for asking. Business professionals come to me because they hit something like stage fright in their most important moment. 
And I teach story skills, storytelling, uh, message design, and delivery so that they can have the stage presence they need to walk into their most important moment. All right, so I pulled that right you know, out of the ether. But when you asked me about me, I instantly started to think about me, but I talked about who I help instead. So that concept is we want to go into interviews. We want to go into networking, by the way. We want to go into business development conversations anywhere where we're the ambassador representing our firm and representing ourselves. We want to take the middle of the story. We want to position the story about you and people like you. And what do you face? What are you dealing with that's difficult? And notice how that keeps your attention on you instead of me. And, and where do you want to be that would be better? And here's what we do to help get you there. So we're always trying to take the helping hero role and talk about how we get main characters to better places. And our instinct is to talk about us and you know, vomit our brochure or, or talk through all of our plans. But what's really motivating is you are in dealing with something and you want to get to a better place. I'm just here to help. So that differentiator is universal differentiator because it goes against our instincts when we go into interviews. And, and that system allows us to differentiate by where we place audiences' attention and, and where we place ourself in, ourselves in their story. Does that make sense? So what I'm hearing you say, Dean, is that one of the key ways firms can differentiate themselves is actually during the live presentation is through their, the way they communicate the value that they yes. deliver. Yes. And that they always make sure they're talking about others they help. That's what the story is about. Who it is that I help, not who am I and why am I so great? So most of the interviews, when, when I come in, if they've already started their progress, uh, hopefully I'm in before that, but if they've already started, the beginning of their interview is all about us. We were founded in 1957 and we have all this stuff and we're so great and we're so great. Um, I like to start the interview about you, selection committee. I mean, you're, you're facing a really tough decision right now. In fact, you're going to make a decision in a matter of hours that is going to have 50 to 100 years of impact. We really recognize the gravity of that. We're here to help. We want to help you be as ready as possible to make that decision. I have just differentiated myself from the other two teams who came in and said, we're this firm, this is when we were founded, and this is, what, this is why we think we're right for the job. I want to keep it about you, not about me. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because in architecture school, they don't teach us this, right? We don't learn to communicate from this framework, right? When we we're even trained, when we get up there and we're presenting our designs, this is what I did. This is why I thought it was. I don't know about you, Dean, but whenever I hear the word, when someone's telling me, I, 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 my little mental switch kind of goes. Yeah. It, it creates a tension and you can feel there's a selfishness to it. And just to, put a blanket of forgiveness on the, the world the the selection committees feel like they're asking the right question. They want to know about you. They want to know why you're good. So they, they put you in the I position just by the nature of the way the interview is set up, but you don't have to stay in that position. Here, here would be a great concept to keep for all of you architects uh, out there to keep in your mind. Um, if, if you, if you let them ask you to defend yourself, you're going to be trapped in that, that mindset of defending yourself, which isn't what you do every day. The, the through line is what you do on the job is you focus on their needs. You focus on their needs and you solve problems. You take them to better places. I'm saying interview with that. So, so you leave this other centric nature of your work that inherently tries to build something that takes someone to a better place. And you go into an interview and you try to sell yourself. And then you're in the why is so great I mode. It's not your mode. So I'm trying to free you to just be you. Go there to the selection committee and help them with their problem, just like you would on the job. That's the through line. And then it makes you more you when you're in that pressure See. Dean, what are some tips or strategies that you can share with us that people would not find in the book? Things that maybe you didn't have time to put in there or high level things that you think are really important that weren't included? Sure, sure. Well, um, yeah, I mean, it is, it's a, it's a small book. Um, 
And uh, so I think the, the first version of the book was 800 pages. So th there's, uh, let, me, let me think how, how, to, how to tackle that question. Um, there's a lot to be learned by studying a selection committee and trying to adapt your approach to what, um, to what kind of people you have on there. Now you'd be surprised even when you don't know them, you can find a, you can read the way they write about themselves on LinkedIn. You can, oh, hey, there's a YouTube video. So think about, you, you've come across discs, social styles, uh, insights, all the personality profiles that break you down into four personality types. Each of those types likes information in a different way. So I don't want to go and dissect that unless, as much as you want to pull out of that, I'm happy to talk about. But imagine if you took the time to ask, hey, who knows so-and-so on this selection committee? A lot of times somebody knows a few of the people and you know somebody that knows the others. If you can try to map out who are they, what kind of people that, that you're dealing with, you, it might give you some tips on how to structure the information. So a lot of the interview strategy for me has to do with figuring out how to speak to whoever has the most power on, on the decision. And it's not always what you'd expect. You, the, the standby is the driver personality, the CEO type. They're the ones that have the power. But when we talk to groups, sometimes it's someone who comes from a much more uh, amiable, relator, human, you know, human resources kind of a background. That should tell you something. The, the relator is going to want more synergy. They're going to want more interaction. So depending who's in power, we might decide to do a more interactive interview. And, or it might be somebody who really needs the facts and the details. If you've got a bunch of engineers on the selection committee, you're going to go heavy into details. If you've got uh, concept people like, uh, like expressives and drivers, they need the higher level details. So the point here is spend some time dissecting the personalities of the selection committee so you can check your idea about how you're planning to approach the interview with the kind of personalities that are sitting there in the room. So it's, not, it's, it's touched on in the book, but it's, it's, it's brief because this is a complex conversation. Dean, something you talk about frequently is this concept of interviewing, but also brand ambassadorship. Would you describe to me the difference between these two and how they both relate to each other? Yeah, the, I'll start with the relating. It was a gradual reveal to us that essentially what we're talking about in an interview is the high pressure cooker version of ambassadorship. We have a challenge representing our firm. We have a challenge differentiating our firm. And what happens is... Um, Imagine you were in a boat and you were the only one paddling. There's often a small group of people, some principals, some business developers who land most of the business that moves the boat forward. Now imagine you're in a boat with a lot of people paddling. The ambassadorship role allows many people to paddle. And if you partake in that, you are playing a role in shaping the future, the work that comes through. That's how you get to do the work that you want to do, is you learn to be a, a seller doer, and you take on the role of ambassador of your firm, of your department, of yourself. And people are afraid to step up which is a huge opportunity for all of you, because if you're one of the firms where you start to get more people to step up, you can differentiate yourself from most of the firms where only a few step up. So what we discovered is the skills that let you be a good ambassador are very, very similar to the skills that let you become a good interviewer. It's just the, the venues vary from conferences and industry events to networking on the job when you're at a client site, where the interview is its own special high pressure moment, but the skills are very similar. For you, what does it mean to be a brand ambassador, Dean? It is to understand what brand your firm is, wants to be, and play a role in educating the world that this is when you should think of us, this is what we are. And brands aren't a logo. A logo is a, is a mark, it's a symbol of a brand. Your brand is whatever the community thinks you are. 
And what we found is, uh, especially companies that are doing, they're actively involved in rebranding or processing their brand, you get the new brand, which is a new understanding. If a branding company helps you build your brand or develop it, what it's about is understanding who you are in relation to the people you serve. So now you got it. You come out with a new logo that reflects and symbolizes that. You launch your new website, branding company's done. This is where the question really begins. How do I, as say a marketing person, who's responsible for this brand, how do I get it through the people? I got say, what if I'm in a firm with 800 people in four offices across the nation? They are not thinking about this. How do I get it to flow through all my people consistently? So a brand ambassador cares about what is that core brand? How do I live it? How do I show it? How do I teach the world? Because you'll get the projects you want as soon as you've taught the world to think of you first on the kinds of projects that you want to get. So that's what, that's what it means to me. It's representing the, and taking responsibility to do your part in communicating that brand. And for you, what is the way to get this to filter through an organization to make sure that people are on board with the brand? They understand what it is and they can communicate it. It's a process. This is so where an interview, say, is maybe a, a matter of weeks to prepare for. This is often a project that's, maybe a year, maybe two. And, and what seems to be working is you, you get, um, first of all, one playing field piece is most of the companies that have multiple offices bought up offices and they promise them autonomy, but, but you'll get part of a bigger, you'll get the horsepower of a bigger organization, but we're gonna give you a lot of autonomy. And then they're like, well, how do we, how do we seem like one company, one entity? So you have to give similar training to all the different branches, or, or if it's all in one house, to all the different departments. Our thought is everyone should get trained because everyone knows people in the community. But the very least is you want to train everyone who's client facing. Doesn't matter what tier they are. So the kinds of things you're gonna be training them in is, is first, we're gonna to have to make sure a training team, team grasps the brand and what's important about it. And then we come up with some language for it. Now, where we deviate from everyone else, they, they come up with some paragraph. Have you ever read one of those branding paragraphs? They had a committee of 16 people crafting this paragraph. And if you ever say it, it just doesn't sound like you. Strip out the language into concepts. You have to teach people what the concepts are. These are the kind of people, they come to us with this problem. This is what we offer to take them to this specific result. Keep it on the concept level and make sure everyone in the company knows the concepts of the brand. And then you want to teach them things like presenting skills, uh, value proposition, elevator speaking. How do you lead a business development conversation? What do I do if I find something? Who do I send it to? So you teach these. So you create a series of training programs. You roll them out slowly. So the window of influence is at least six months, probably a year and a half. And you give every single group of people the exact same training. So they're all structuring messages the same. They all value proposition the same. And they all have those concepts. And, and then the last piece, if that makes sense so far, is just universal training. The thing that's sometimes hard with, with, there's a company we're working with right now where it's working amazingly well because leadership is saying, oh, I will learn with them. So one of the biggest mistakes, a time I saw it almost take and then not take. Leadership was like, we got this thing. We're the ones that landed all this business. We're the ones that know how to do this. So they didn't want to participate in relearning something or kind of tinkering with their own methods. So they just let us work with the rest of the team. So now the rest of the team has a system that the leadership isn't modeling. And it goes away. So you've got to make sure that leadership is on board and actively owns it so that when I'm, say, I'm ha a mid-career professional, I come into a group, wow, well, she's doing it. Oh, he's got the same process, and you reinforce it. That's how it's going to take. And so then those skills flow through all the people, and those brand concepts come out in your own words. You can say it the way you say it. I'll say it the way I say it, but it's still the same thing. That's the process. And it, it, takes, it takes a while to, to align, but it does leave you freedom and it lets you be you, but we're all 
uh, consistent. Dean, I know you, you lead seminars, you, you come in and you train companies and you have coaching and consulting. Have you had, can you think of any specific stories? I'd like to see if there's a specific story without revealing the names of the, of the innocent where you went into an organization and it was like, maybe there was someone in the group who was just, it was like pulling teeth. It was like, you could not convince them that your way was the right way. They'd been doing it the right way the whole time. Is there anything that comes to mind along those lines? Well, there can be, uh, buy-in is really important. Where we've had the biggest challenges is when two separate companies come together and say, we're going to team up on an interview. And we maybe made the mistake of assuming everyone was bought in, but it turns out one of the companies, the one that actually did the hiring of you is bought in. And the other team isn't sure who you are. And so I've definitely had some times where the, it, it can become a, a power struggle because think of it this way. Whoever's sitting in that interview prep, preparing for the interview, has probably gotten there for a lot of years of hard work. If they're not bought into the idea of doing a process with you, then they're going to interpret you as saying you don't know how to do this. So a big part of the process is recognizing who hasn't bought in and then spending the time to win them over. And you can't always win people over, but part of it is recognizing they can do an interview without you. They, they wouldn't be here if they hadn't gotten to this point. So it's how can we align on, on one strategy and methodology and uh, get them all together. So that's kind of the power struggle version. I think maybe a better answer to that would be what's more common is when fear gets in the way and say an introverted analytical person is afraid that you're asking them uh, to do, to be something that they aren't or can't be. So when I spot that, I usually try, uh, you can, you can hopefully predict it in the initial meetings and setting up a project, but you might need to stop and do some training. Um, there was an interview that was coming up where I knew that the people were going to be unlikely to buy in and we knew it was coming. So what we did is before the interview started, we created a, a little training experience outside of that pressure. And then we, we coached them so that they would be ready. But I mean, every single combination is different. You've got so many different personality types and it is impossible to expect universal buy-in and everybody on the same page. So it's, it's a process of working the personalities. I don't know if I love my answer to your question, but it's, it's, it's so variable. Dean, what would you say if you had to summarize, what would be your top three pointers for doing live presentations to groups? Sure. Um, I would, uh, I'm going to try to give you three pointers, one related to strategy, one related to message design, and one related to delivery, because that's sort of what the package you're contending with. When you go into your strategy, you, the, the simplest advice that I could give is go there, not, okay, get ready for this. So don't go to win a project. As counterintuitive as it is, go to help your prospect. Go to help them. If you think about it all from the point of view of how you can serve them in that interview and help them get to a better place, your mindset is going to be more like you. So strategically, the simple bottom line is my prospect is facing a really, really tough decision especially because they're probably not going to pick two crappy firms and your firm, they're going to pick three good firms. So it's going to be a hard decision and the decision is going to affect years and years and years and years and years, if not decades or eons. So you want to go there to help and that's going to position your team in a much more friendly, positive, comfortable mindset. And what you're going to help them do is get ready to make a good decision for them. So that would be my strategic tip. Go there to help. Don't go to win a project. You'll be more likely to win a project if you can go there truly earnestly to help. Now, the message design tip is be the hero of the story. Don't be the main character. Talk about who you help. Every story you craft should be about moving the prospect, the project team, their customers, their clients, the people they care about forward. And you're always going to position yourself as the helping hero who has solutions to help them get there. 
if there was a bad side of a river and a good side of a river, you're here to build a bridge so they can go across. So that would be tip number two. Posi assume the hero position, do not be the main character. And the delivery uh, pointer, it, we talked about in somewhat uh, some depth. You need two vibes at once to have the right winning presence. I need my laser confidence, which is usually comes through that strong, direct, extended eye contact. And I want to warm it up with appreciation so that I'm both strong and approachable at the same time. It's a very compelling charismatic vibe to be positive and stern at the same time. And, and so I would really focus on looking for that new addition, the new definition of bold, where it's command and nurture all in one package. Those would be my top three. Great. So let me make sure I understand them correctly. So the last one you mentioned, number three, was this idea of command and nurture. And yes. you explained to us what that means. Number two was, so you said, first of all, there was strategy, there was messaging and delivery. Is that right? Yes. And I hear the one sentence version of these. It says, well, strategies go there to help, not to sell. And message is assume the hero position in the stories you tell. And the delivery was, was direct eye contact and appreciation to create that commanding nurturing presence. Awesome. Dean, thank you for that. You've made a wonderful uh, gesture towards our guests to actually give them a free yeah. copy of your book. Yes. Yes. Um, and w the way you, you would do this is you would go to our website, which is sagepresence.com. And that, by the way, is just take a T out of stage presence and you've You've got our name. So sagepresence.com. There's a products link. You click on that, you'll see the book. Looks like this. And if you, when you go through the ordering process, enter the code uh, business, it's B-O-A, Business of Architecture 2019. And B-O-A 2019 will get you the book for free. And um, I, it's, it's, gonna, it's probably going to uh, charge you shipping. So I think our system will charge you shipping, but it will zero out the cost of the book. And we'd love to have you read it. We put a lot of time into making a simple, short answer uh, to this tough challenge of interviewing. Excellent. So, hey, Architect Nation, Tribe, let's overwhelm Dean with the responsiveness of the Business of Architecture Tribe. Go get all of his free books. Just completely sell them out so he literally has to be overwhelmed shipping out these free books. I'd so he, love to have connection with all of you. So that's fine by me. That's right. Absolutely. So there you go. Dean Lincoln hires. Thank you so much for being here with us today on the business of architecture podcast. Thank you. Enoch. And that is a wrap as a podcast listener. I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.